Chinese international diplomacy commenced in the 11th year of the Xianfeng reign, 1861, when the Zhongli Yamen, Ministry of Foreign Affairs, was first established in Peking. From then, it would be 50 years to the end of the Qing dynasty. During this period, foreign aggression grew ever more intense, yet outstanding ambassadors appeared one after the other, such as Guo Songtao, 1818 to 1891, Hansen Berlingham, 1820 to 1870, Zheng Jizhe, 1839, to 1890, Wu Tingfang, 1842 to 1922, Xu Jingchen, 1845 to 1900, Chen Jitong, 1851 to 1907, and Lu Zhenxiang, 1871 to 1949. Many of the ambassadors stationed abroad were by nature inclined towards political reform. When the Wu Chang uprising broke out in the third year of the Xuantong reign, 1911, Lu Zhenxiang and Wu Tingfang in particular favored the republican political system, and they both urged the Qing emperor to abdicate. After the founding of the Republic of China in 1912, they were appointed foreign minister in succession. The Ministry of Foreign Affairs of the Republic of China has continuously enlisted those knowledgeable about East and West. Many of these diplomats are now commended by history because of their accomplishments and integrities. During the 112 years since the founding of the Republic of China, not a day goes by without her diplomats strategizing the direction of the country whilst treacherously encircled, tackling powerful enemies in thorn-filled terrains. It is discernible that the diplomatic tradition of striving against the tides of misfortunes has continued and is carried on by the Republican government from the Qing dynasty, and that the lofty ambitions of the Confucianists in two epochs to save the country from catastrophes are comparable. As the United States has always been the foremost diplomatic stronghold, Chinese ministers and ambassadors assigned there were the finest of their generations, such as Yong Wing, 1828-1912, Zhang Yingwan, 1837-1900, Wu Tingfang, 1842-1922, Liang Chen, 1864-1917, Gu Weijun, 1888 to 1985. Si Saoji, 1877 to 1958. Wang Zhenting, 1882 to 1961. Hu Si, 1891 to 1962. Wei Daoming, 1899 to 1978. Hollington, Xian 1887 to 1971. George Gongchao Ye, 1904 to 1981. Jiang Tingfu, 1895 to 1965. Zhou Su Kai, 1913 to 1992. Sun Chang Huan, 1913 to 1998. And lately, Sun Lu At a time of grave internal political confrontations and predatory communist hostilities across the Taiwan Strait. Ambassador Sun defended the honor of the Republic of China in adversity and pursued her national interests amid perils.
He was indeed an exemplary model for future generations. Ambassador Sun was born on 12th November in the 38th year of the Republic, 1949, and passed away on 6th January in the 112th year of the Republic, 2023. He was a native of Hou Guan, Fujian province, and a grandson of the sixth generation of Viceroy Sun Baozhen, 1820 to 1879. He graduated from the Taipei Municipal Jianguo High School, School of Law and Business at Zhongxing University, and the Department of Diplomacy at the National Zhengzi University. Afterwards, he studied at the University of Pennsylvania, attaining a doctorate degree. In the 71st year of the Republic, 1982, he became a consultant at the Congressional Group of the Coordinating Council for North American Affairs. In the 77th year of the Republic, 1988, he was the Assistant Director General of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and the first Section Chief of the Department of North American Affairs. In the 80th year of the Republic, 1991, he was the Director General of the Taipei Economic and Cultural Representative Office in Kansas City. In the 82nd year of the Republic, 1993, he was the Director of the Political Division as well as the Director of the Congressional Division of the Taipei Economic and Cultural Representative Office in the United States. In the 85th year of the Republic, 1996, he was the Director General of the Taipei Economic and Cultural Representative Office in the United States. In the 88th year of the Republic, 1999, he was the Deputy Representative of the Taipei Economic and Cultural Representative Office in the United States. In the 92nd year of the Republic, 2003, he was the Director General of the Taipei Economic and Cultural Representative Office in Geneva, Switzerland. In the 97th year of the Republic, 2008, he was the representative of the Taipei Representative Office in the European Union and Belgium. In the following year, he was the Deputy Minister of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. In the 100th year of the Republic, 2011, he was the representative of the Taipei Representative Office in the United Kingdom. In the 103rd year of the Republic, 2014, he was the representative of the Taipei Economic and Cultural Office in the United States. In the 105th year of the Republic, 2016, he retired and returned to Taiwan after rotation of the political party in power. In the summer of the 106th year of the Republic, 2017, I was introduced to Ambassador Sun Lüxun by my friends, Mr. and Mrs. Mao Zhuoyi. At that time, Song Tao Society was planning the event for the commemoration of the 80th anniversary of the Marco Polo Bridge incident and the war of resistance against Japanese aggression, and Ambassador Sun was invited to give a speech. On Saturday, 8th July that year, scores of national flags were placed outside the venue of Huasan 1914 Creative Park in Taipei. National flags and national emblems were also hung alternatively on the two aisles inside the building. It was a grand and touching spectacle. Ambassador Sun spoke for 17 minutes. He made references to history 
in correlation to the present. His content was meticulous and substantial. His thread of discourse was penetrating. There was a passion in his gracefulness. There was a rapier flash in his refinement. Resoluteness and patriotism permeated each word. Indeed, he well deserved the reputation as an eminent senior diplomat of the Republic of China. In his speech, he told of being invited by the United States government in the 104th year of the Republic, 2015, during his tenure in the United States to attend the commemoration of the 70th victory anniversary of the Second World War, which naturally also represented the commemoration of the 70th victory anniversary of the Chinese War of Resistance against Japanese aggression. The venue was the World War II Memorial in Washington, and 14 national representatives of the Allies were invited. The United States government also invited the Chinese Communist representative in the United States to attend due to recognition of the Chinese Communist government and severance of political relationship with the Republic of China since 1st January 1979. When Ambassador Sun realized it was not possible to place the national flag of the Republic of China on the wreath. He came up with a clever stratagem and said to the American official in charge, during the Chinese war of resistance against Japanese aggression, 3,220,000 Chinese soldiers died for the flag of blue sky and white sun, the national flag of the Republic of China. For these dead souls who are now in the underworld or heaven above, if they are unable to find their national flag, how can we comfort them? How can we honor them? When they were alive, they had the national emblem in the center of their military hats or helmets. If we can substitute the flag with the emblem and place the emblem on the wreath. The dead souls can still see the image long buried in their hearts. They can then be present here, and we will not undermine our sincerity to honor them. The American official was sympathetic and agreed. When the communist representatives arrived at the memorial, they were alarmed and hastily protested. The Americans did not back down, and the communist representatives pulled out from the commemoration. Ambassador Sun concluded in his speech that the national emblem, though merely the size of a palm, could still resist and push back the communists, for it had been forged by the righteous blood and loyal hearts of Chinese soldiers and civilians. I personally believe that if Ambassador Sun did not always hold the honor and history of the country in his heart and soul, he would not be able to come up with this quick-witted response. Yet, how inadequate are the words quick-witted response to fully convey his aspiration Ambassador Sun was born in November in the 38th year of the Republic, 1949, at a time when mainland China was about to fall to the communists. One month later, the central government of the Republic of China relocated to Taiwan. Many of his forefathers also served in the diplomatic corps the impressions from their conversations and observations might have induced a sense of loss 
and sorrow not shared with outsiders. Ambassador Sun was 30 years old when the United States severed political relationship with the Republic of China in the 68th year of the Republic, 1979. Notwithstanding the time of great uncertainty and insecurity, he set his heart on diplomacy, knowing that he must serve his country out of grief and anguish. His aspiration to reverse the course of history was no less fervent when he later became the representative of the Taipei Economic and Cultural Office in the United States. I have a photograph given by Ambassador Sun of the wreath offered by the Republic of China at the commemoration of the 70th victory anniversary of the Second World War in Washington in the 104th year of the Republic, 2015. The national emblem of blue sky and white sun rested solidly and radiantly on the wreath. On the back of the photograph, he inscribed the following words. On 2nd September 2015, at the commemoration of the 70th victory anniversary of the Second World War in Washington, the Color Guard of the United States Marine Corps held the wreath decorated with the national emblem from a country for homage. I, Sun Luxun, representative of the Republic of China, participated in the wreath laying. The Chinese Communist representative was absent. Sun Luxun, 12th July in the 106th year of the Republic, 2017, Taipei. I reverently treasure this photograph as much as an archaic jade disc. Since the commemoration of the 80th anniversary of the Marco Polo Bridge incident and the war of resistance against Japanese aggression in the 106th year of the Republic, 2017, I gradually saw Ambassador Sun more frequently. On 10th October in the same year, Sun Tao Society was the chief organizer of the National Day celebration of flag and country, and Ambassador Sun was again invited to speak. Although his speech lasted only three minutes, it was succinct, polished, and elegant. When he recounted how, after the severance of political relationship between the Republic of China and the United States for 38 years, he managed to hoist the national flag of the Republic of China on the grounds of Twin Oaks in Washington, the official address of the Taipei Economic and Cultural Office in the United States once more. The audience erupted into exuberant applause. On 4th May in the following year, Sung Tao Society organized the commemoration of Fu Si Nian and the 99th anniversary of the May 4th movement. Mm -hmm. 
Ambassador Sun was not only delighted to attend, After the event, he immediately hurried over to attend the opening ceremony of the commemoration exhibition of the 99th anniversary of the May 4th movement and delivered a special lecture. The title was Homage to the 100th Anniversary of the May 4th Movement, Remembering the Legacies of Past Diplomats. Ambassador Sun spoke for 33 minutes, recalling with eloquence the undisclosed stories of Chinese diplomacy during the Paris Peace Conference and the anecdotes of the Chinese delegates, which made up for the shortcomings of existing historical chronicles. His unique ability to use his decades-long experience and training of a diplomat to explain the historical events in diplomacy was unmatched. His speech flowed like shifting clouds and running water. The topics interlocked in succession without a moment of stalling nor slowing. The address was made in one continuous delivery from beginning to end. Orators have always been rare since ancient times. Ambassador Sun was a worthy luminary in oratory to rival his predecessor, Anson Burlingham, at the two ends of the time spectrum. The speeches made by Ambassador Sun at the commemoration of the 80th anniversary of the Marco Polo Bridge incident and the war of resistance against Japanese aggression, the National Day celebration of flag and country in the 106th year of the Republic, 2017, and homage to the 100th anniversary of the May 4th movement, remembering the legacies of past diplomats, are all now available on the internet. His image and voice are of course for all to pay tribute, but one especially hopes that future generations will be inspired not to abandon the reconstruction of China. The text of the speech, homage to the 100th anniversary of the May 4th movement Remembering the Legacies of Past Diplomats was compiled in the book The Struggle to Reverse Destiny, Commemoration of the 100th Anniversary of the May 4th Movement, published in the 108th year of the Republic, 2019. It was no less than a tribute from Free China to the 100th Anniversary of the May 4th Movement. Before the opening ceremony of the commemoration exhibition of the 99th anniversary of the May 4th movement, Ambassador Sun had originally wished to invite Ambassador Victor Wei of Belgium to attend. Ambassador Victor Wei happened to be traveling in Taipei in April. One evening, Ambassador Sun invited myself and Ambassador Wei to dinner. Ambassador Wei is the former Belgian ambassador to Korea. His grandfather, Wei Chenzu, 1885 to 1942, was one of the five delegates from China at the Paris Peace Conference in the eighth year of the Republic, 1919. Wei Chenzu was the Chinese minister to Belgium at that time. His descendants became citizens of Belgium and his grandson followed his professional footsteps. 
The mother of Ambassador Victor Wei was Jiang Hua, the daughter of the eminent military strategist Jiang Fangzhen, 1882 to 1938. That evening, I brought along 20 letters by Jiang Fangzhen in my family collection as conversation pieces. Unfortunately, Ambassador Wei had already fixed his return date and could not attend the opening ceremony. Ambassador Sun then asked Ambassador Wei to inscribe some words to enhance the appeal of the exhibition later. One morning, a few days later, I visited Ambassador Wei at his hotel. I presented him with paper and pen, and soon I received a sheet of inscription. The words read, As a retired Belgian diplomat and grandson of one of the Chinese representatives to the 1919 Peace Conference in Paris, I cannot fail to applaud the commemoration of the May 4th movement. Sparked by the refusal of the Allied powers to use self-determination for solving the Sandong question, this far-reaching movement has largely been forgotten. If the idea of remembering has my full support, I cannot judge its implementation here, having not seen any of the items present. Moreover, my opinion does not engage my government. Victor Wei, Honorary Ambassador of Belgium, 25th April, 2018. The inscription by Ambassador Victor Wei was placed in the exhibition and printed in the book as a means to lead people today to revisit the Paris Peace Conference. Ambassador Sun generously offered his assistance with this purpose in mind. There is an ancient saying, crying disconsolately while reading the poem Li Sao by Qu Yuan, 339 to 278 BC. I fear modern Chinese history brings so much sorrow that tears can fill rivers and seas. In the context of the Paris Peace Conference, later generations are yet to be freed from the lingering pain caused by the preemptory behavior of the great powers and the despair and perseverance of our forefathers. The road of the Republic of China is tortuous and hazardous. Ambassador Sun understood this well, having handled diplomacy for decades. Hence, he studied history thoroughly and acquired a rigorous understanding of cause and effect, success and failure, perhaps in order to discover an exit from such immense difficulties. I suspect this was the reason he engaged his talents in historical studies. In his speech, he mentioned that he had read the correspondence archives between the Chinese delegation to the Paris Peace Conference and the government in Peking. And only then did he realize that Chinese citizens sent nearly 7,000 telegrams in all to the delegation, urging them not to sign the Treaty of Versailles. Ambassador Sun's scholarship was both expansive in scope and meticulous in detail. 
To be brimming with historical knowledge is basically an affair of personal learning. Yet, in diplomacy, this can occasionally achieve vital accomplishments. Ambassador Sun once described the deeds of Lu Zhenxiang, foreign minister and chief delegate to the Paris Peace Conference, to an eminent Belgian politician who was captivated by the story. It is not known who this politician is, as Ambassador Sun did not reveal the name. I hypothesize that he is likely to be Count Hermann van Rompuy, whose own lineage prompted his interest in history. In the 97th year of the Republic, 2008, while Ambassador Sun was the representative of the Taipei Representative Office in the European Union and Belgium, Count van Rompuy was the Prime Minister of Belgium. From 2009 to 2014, Count van Rompuy was the President of the European Council. Lu Zhenxiang is now generally regarded as the first Foreign Minister of the Republic of China. There was originally a predecessor, Wang Chonghui, 1881 to 1958, Foreign Minister to the Southern Government led by Dr. Sun Yat-sen, 1866 to 1925. However, the government only lasted three months, for the position of provisional president was succeeded by Yuan Sikai, 1859 to 1916. The career and accomplishments of Lu Zhenxiang are illustrious and remarkable. In his later years, he relinquished the secular world and entered a monastery in Belgium. Here is an outline of his deeds. Lu Zhenxiang, 1871-1949 Zi Zi Xing Zi Xing Native of Shanghai, Jiangsu Province His father, Chen An, Zi Yunfeng, was a Christian missionary. Hence, Lu Zhenxiang was baptized as a Christian. In the tenth year of the Guangxi reign, 1884, he enrolled in the School of Foreign Languages in Shanghai to study French. In the 17th year of the Guangxi reign, 1891, he enrolled in Tongwen College. In the 19th year of the Guangxi reign, 1893, he was an interpreter at the Chinese legation at St. Petersburg in Russia. He stayed there for 14 years and left in the 32nd year of the Guangxi reign, 1906, he was commanded by Xu Jingchen, envoy to Russia. Their teacher and student friendship lasted five years until Xu was executed by Empress Dowager Cixi for his opposition against the Boxers in the 26th year of the Guangxi reign, 1900. In the 25th year of the Guangxi reign, 1899, he married Berthe Bove, daughter of a Belgian major and a Catholic who was senior by 16 years. At that time, interracial marriage was rare, but they were very much in love till the end. In the 32nd year of the Guangxi reign, 1906, he was minister and a potentiary of the legation in The Hague. In the following year, he was appointed ambassador to the Second International Peace Conference in The Hague. In the third year of the Xuantong reign, 1911, he was minister of the legation in St. Petersburg and later converted to the Catholic faith. 
The Wutong uprising broke out on 10th October. On 31st December, he telegraphed the emperor and urged him to abdicate. In March, in the first year of the Republic, 1912, he was appointed Minister of the Department of Foreign Affairs. In June, he was appointed Prime Minister. And in September, he returned as Minister of the Department of Foreign Affairs. In the eighth year of the Republic, he was appointed Chief Delegate of the Chinese delegation to the Paris Peace Conference, whereby the Chinese delegation refused to sign the Treaty of Versailles. In the 11th year of the Republic, 1922, the health of Madame Lu deteriorated. They moved to Switzerland for her recovery, and he became Minister of the Legation in Switzerland. In April, in the 15th year of the Republic, 1926, Madame Lu passed away. He was heartbroken. In July in the following year, he entered the Abbey of St. André, a Catholic Benedictine Abbey at Bruges in Belgium, as a novitiate. In the 24th year of the Republic, 1935, he was ordained to priesthood. In the 35th year of the Republic, 1946, His Holiness Pope Pius XII conferred on him the title of Saint Pierre of Gant. He wrote Souvenir et Pensée. After Madame Lu passed away, Lu Zhenxiang became a Benedictine monk in her hometown of Bruges. He kept her company in life and in death, their story, the envy of romantics. The eminent Belgian politician was fascinated by their story and developed goodwill towards the distant Republic of China, far away in the East. Sometime later, Ambassador Sun was instructed to secure visa-free entry to European countries for Chinese nationals holding Republic of China passports. The eminent Belgian politician was then in an influential position at the European Council, and he was happy to offer his assistance. In a short period of over a year, on 11th January of the 100th year of the Republic, 2011, 36 European countries agreed to permit Chinese nationals holding Republic of China passports visa-free entry, not exceeding 90 days within a six-month period. This was a huge triumph in diplomacy for the Republic of China. The arrival of this opportunity was in fact fostered by the historical knowledge cultivated by Ambassador Sun, who was able to cross time and history in extending the sanctuary provided by Lu Zhenxiang. This is evidence that history is the strongest power of the Republic of China, as well as her rich and magnificent inheritance. Ambassador Sun once gifted me a compact disc produced by the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in the 100th year anniversary of the founding of the Republic of China, titled Building Bridges to the World, Lu Zhenxiang, the Republic of China's first foreign minister. The compact disc is probably hard to come by nowadays. In the 100th year of the Republic, 2011, Ambassador Sun 
was the representative of the Taipei Representative Office in the United Kingdom. Although he was embroiled in national affairs, he did not neglect scholarly pursuits in his leisure. Ambassador Sun discovered and presented me with a copy of Dr. Sun Yat-sen's admission record to the reading room at the British Museum, dated 5th December, 1896. Dr. Sun Yat-sen filled in different spaces in the record in his own handwritings. They are Purpose for which admission is required Chinese literature Name Sun Yat-sen Wen Address 8 Grace in Place Profession or Occupation Medical Man Date December 5th, 1889. The date 5th December, 1889, was Dr. Sun Yat-sen's first admission to the reading room. The late admission date of 5th December, 1896, was indicated by the stamp on the top right corner. The inscription below the stamp and the inscription on the top left corner. Between 11th October 1896 and 23rd October 1896, Dr. Sun Yat-sen was kidnapped by members of the Qing legation in London, an episode well known in history. After his release, he frequently visited the reading room and left England the following year. In the 103rd year of the Republic, 2014, Ambassador Sun was the representative of the Taipei Economic and Cultural Office in the United States. He visited the Brown Palace Hotel in Denver. and discovered the register with the signature of Dr. Sun Yat-sen when he checked in on 10th October in 1911. He once presented me with a copy of the register page. Dr. Sun's signature was the second last name in the left row. On 10th October, in the third year of the Xuantong reign, 1911, the Wu Chong uprising broke out in haste. Dr. Sun was still in the United States raising funds for armaments. Many provinces consecutively rose in revolt. On 2nd December, the combined revolutionary army from Jiangsu and Zhejiang provinces captured Nanking. On 12th December, Representatives of the 14 rebel provinces gathered in Nanking. On 17th December, they nominated Li Yuanhong, 1864 to 1928, as commander in chief, and Huang Xing, 1874 to 1916, as deputy commander in chief. On 29th December, they elected Dr. Sun Yat-sen as the provisional president. 
On 1st January in the following year, the Republic of China was founded and Dr. Sun was inaugurated the provisional president. In the 100th year of the Republic, 2011, Ambassador Sun and Ms. Feng Mingzhu, the director of the National Palace Museum, compiled the catalog. A Century of Resilient Tradition Exhibition of the Republic of China's Diplomatic Archives Many of the important international treaties of the Qing Dynasty and the Republic of China were assembled. The wealth of information is unprecedented. As Ambassador Sun was an expert historian of diplomatic history, it is reasonable to conjecture that he contributed most of the writings. Ambassador Sun gifted me with this book and signed on the last page as follows. Sun Lu Xun, Lu Xun Sun, July 12, 2017. On the title page, he inscribed in Chinese. For the rectification of my friend Xu Kang, your collection and knowledge of modern Chinese history can be compared favorably with this book, Sun Lu Xuan, 12th July, in the 106th year of the Republic, 2017, Taipei. I knew Ambassador Sun for seven years. During this time, he generously proffered his approbation beyond my worth, for which I am forever grateful. As Ambassador Sun was a grandson of the sixth generation of Viceroy Sun Baozhen, the times and events of late Qing would have weighed on him. With the country's fate hanging by a thread, the call to action to rescue the country and ensure survival indeed became the casual cycle for seven generations of the Sun family. His disposition would have been forged by the trials and tribulations of history. I remember distinctly the day when Ambassador Sun visited me at home. He was stirred and delighted with a pair of calligraphy couplets by Wu Ke Du, 1812 to 1879, on the wall. I realized that he was extremely knowledgeable about the history of the Qing dynasty. Today, in Taiwan, there may be only a few persons who still know about Wu Ke Du. Wu Ke Du wrote a memorial to the throne, accusing the Dowager Empresses to have erred in selecting the heir to the throne in the fifth year of the Guangxu reign, 1879, for it could only be inherited by the designated heir to the deceased Emperor Mu Zong. He then took a dose of poison and committed suicide. With his death, he compelled the issue to be reconsidered in court. It was a heroic act that shocked the nation, but its moral example aroused a whole generation. Ambassador Sun upheld the comportment of the ancient court officials, and he must have found the life of Wu Ke Du deeply moving. That day, I also showed him some inscribed works by the Occidental scholars W.A.P. Martin and James Legg, all contemporaries of his forefather, Sun Baozhen. I was delighted that they were greatly appreciated by Ambassador Sun, a fellow enthusiast. 
In the 108th year of the Republic, 2019, Ambassador Sun suffered a stroke. His friends were all worried and distressed. Since it was inappropriate to disturb him while sick, I only made a few short calls on occasion to express concern. Whenever I saw an article of his in the United Daily News, it brought prolonged relief and I hurried to alert our friends in order to tell them that his illness had not worsened and the day of his full recovery was in sight. On 7th October, in the 110th year of the Republic, 2021, Song Tao Society organized a press conference for the launch of the Chinese Heritage Virtual Museum and Ambassador Sun was invited to speak. In testimony of true friendship, he made a great effort to attend even in the middle of his recuperation. During the several years of the pandemic, I dared not arrange to meet nor visit him, yet he was very much in my mind. On 7th January in Guimao year 2023, news of his death unexpectedly arrived. It is known that Ambassador Sun enjoyed practicing diplomatic etiquette at a young age when his deportment and views were already distinct. Lu Zhenxiang also reminisced about his rigorous training in diplomatic etiquette under the tutelage of his teacher, Xu Jingchen. Perhaps the ambitions and inclinations of Ambassador Sun and Minister Lu had much in common. The former encountered the kindred spirit of the latter in history and utilized the latter's legacy to benefit our own age. When Ambassador Sun was dying, his speech was blurred and inaudible, except for his last words, Ministry of Foreign Affairs. How can those of us still living not be moved to tears by his deep patriotism. Words from the deathbed are distillations from the heart's true candor. The final words of Dr. Sun Yat Sen were Peace, strive, save China. Those of Wang Fu, 1883 to 1936, were First Army, Second Army, Forward, Retreat, Battle Cries in the War Against Japan. Now, Ambassador Sun departed with these words, Ministry of Foreign Affairs. It is China's good fortune to have you gentlemen as her subjects, but it is China's misfortunes that drove you gentlemen to leave with such solitary regrets forever. <laughs>